so does migraine. Okay. And many is disease, sex ratio is about equal. Actually, migraine's commoner in boys than girls, but in adulthood, it becomes a lot commoner uh, in, in females. But look at this number, and this is a number I want you to remember. The incidence of Meniere's disease is about 1 in 1,000, 1 in 2,000 population. Incidence of migraine. Who gets migraine in the room? Yeah, that's about right. Probably one too much. About 10%, 10, 15% of the population get migraine. 10% of migraine attacks are vestibular. 10%. So about 1% of the population get vestibular migraine. Therefore, for every one patient you see with Meniere's disease in the balance clinic, you're probably going to see 10 with vestibular migraine. Ah. Uh. Big number, isn't it? So how many have you misdiagnosed? So think that through when you see your patients. Okay, so let's look at some def definitions. We can, cause men we can call many as a disease, the idiopathic version, a syndrome, when it's associated with other things. But I want to get this concept over that many as can affect just the cochlear with fluctuating fullness here in os tinnitus, or just the vestibular labyrinth with fluctuating <coughs> dizziness to start with. And you know the anatomy, don't you? Uh, this is actually this is large vestibular aqueduct for anyone wanting to get the gold medal in the exam. It's the cause of cochlear implantation, sensory neural hearing loss. But what I've done here is I've done an endoscopic endolymphatic sac decompression. And in the same plane, this is me pushing the posterior phosphor away, and there's the endolymphatic duct. So there's, there's, a, there's an anatomical contributor to Meniere's disease. What the cause is, I don't know. And we know there is a final common pathway of high drops. But that's probably not causal. It's a consequence of whatever the trigger is. And who knows? Maybe many years in migraine are the same condition. I don't know. Maybe many years in the brain leads to high drops. I'm not telling you that. But they're so similar, there are lots of things we're thinking about. OK, so let's look at definitions. Now, those of you doing the exams need to know these definitions. They have changed. It used to be possible, probable, definite, and certain. And being American, of course, the only way you could have a certain diagnosis was to be dead, because that was a histological diagnosis. So they, they've removed that one. And now we have probable or definite Meniere's disease. But look how vague probable Meniere's disease is. Episodic vertigo, 20 minutes to 24 hours, that must encompass a lot of people with migraine. And some fluctuating oral symptoms, a bit of fullness, tinnitus, and so on. But having an allowable diagnosis of probable Meniere's disease, set diagnosis of probable Meniere's disease, allows you quite a lot of power and confidence in clinic. Because you don't have to say, well, I'm not sure what it is. You can say, this is definitely probable Meniere's disease on criteria, if that makes sense. But it gives you some confidence that you can start treatment. And then definite Meniere's disease is two or more attacks of vertigo, 20 minutes to 12 hours, low frequency sensory neural loss, fluctuating, you know the three, hearing loss, tinnitus, and oral fullness. No other cause identified. Okay, what do we do to investigate it? The history is really important. Much the most important investigation is the audiogram. I think caloric testing is really important. Others may disagree with me, but it's very important if you're going to do any ablative treatment. So if you're going to do surgery, if you can use gentamicin, you want to make sure that the vestibular labyrinth is working on the other side. So I think that's a useful test to have. VNG testing, uh, when the ear's damaged, you'll get fast phase away from the affected ear. But during an attack, and I'm really rotten, and I've done this to some people having attacks, you get the, the uh, nice diagnosis beating towards the affected ear. Um, VEMPS, we've done a little bit of work on VEMPS. Uh, ECOGs, I've done hundreds and hundreds with one of my great heroes, Professor Gibson in Sydney. I must say I don't use them now really very much. Uh, and you need to do an MRI scan as well, for sure. You know the low-frequency hearing loss. It's very typical of Meniere's disease, and it fluctuates. And you know that uh, Meniere's symptoms can be triggered by acoustic neuroma, uh, and you need to get a scan. So how do we treat them? Well, the first thing to do is remember that slide that Meniere's is five conditions in one. So you treat the BPPV, you treat the migraine, you treat the vestibulopathy, and you address any anxiety. Because although Meniere's is an organic condition, there's no question that stress, amongst other things, can drive attacks of Meniere's disease. So try and get the migraine under control, et cetera, to reduce the physiological stress the patient's experiencing 
and reduce the number of attacks they're having, and maybe <coughs> avoid interventional treatment. And never listen to anyone who says, there's nothing you can do for Meniere's disease. There's a whole industry out there. But actually, there's a lot of really good treatments you can do. And here's a range of them. So we start with diet and all the rest of it, reassurance. I, I would always say in a low-sodium diet, two and a half grams of salt a day, cut out bacon, sausages, uh, salted bread, cereals. Have, have a look at all of that and have a fairly strict diet. And it works quite well for many as personality. Be careful with caffeine and alcohol. Sort of note the overlap with migraine there. For acute attacks, you might use stematil. Circ, well, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Diuretics, if you're Australian, they, they can drink urea. Um, I've never met anyone in England willing to have it. But if you've got someone who's getting married, take that in the morning, mix with some, something strong, knock back some urea. They won't, it's obviously, as a diuretic, they won't have an attack during the day. So it's just a, just a thought. How about beta histine? So we all prescribe beta histine for many years, don't we? And look, it works, doesn't it? There are a number of attacks on beta histine. Let me get the right one. On, on low and high dose beta histine, the number of attacks taking it dropped dramatically. So that reinforces the fact that it works, except that it drops just the same amount with placebo. Uh, now we've got a problem. So this was published in the BMJ. It's meta-analysis. So can you ethically prescribe beta histine when you know from this meta-analysis published in the BMJ, <coughs> Strupp, fantastic name in many SSEs, 2016, when you know that one of the major publications has shown no benefit beyond placebo? Well, you've got a problem now. Because you can't say to your patient, let's start you on the medication. This is going to get you, get, going to get you better. Well, my advice is discuss that paper. I always discuss that paper with the patients. And I say there are other papers showing it's something of a vestibular sedative. And it may well work. And it's very unlikely to do harm unless you've got you know, asthma and so on. So I do use it a bit. And it may or may not help. But be cautious on that. Grommets, pressure change, atmospheric pressure change, seems to be really important for many of those patients. I don't know why they work, but they seem to work, and some patients <laughs> swear by them. My practice has changed very significantly over the years. So having spent a year with Professor Gibson in Sydney 15 years ago, I was a great believer in endolymphatic sac decompression, and, and still am, and I still do it occasionally, but very rarely now. An interest in panic therapy has now replaced nearly all other elements of treatment. And for many patients, other than beyond conservative therapy and reassurance, intratympanic therapies are often now my first-line treatment because we now have really powerful evidence for their efficacy. And it's a low-risk treatment. And these fantastic colleagues, another utter hero of mine, uh, Adolfo Bronstein, uh, professor of neurology uh, at Imperial, and, and someone you know very well, uh, Johnny Harcourt down at Charing Cross, and the team many years, a number of years ago, started uh, an RCT uh, of solumedrone, pred uh, prednisolone versus gentamicin, and then I joined in a bit later to try and, I'm not the brains behind this, to be clear, I just got the numbers up and was very privileged to be involved in the study. And we ran an RCT between solumedrone and gentamicin, intratympanically, again for the exam, it's a study you definitely need to know, published in The Lancet, November 2016. And it, it's a superb study. There's no control, no control arm, um, placebo control arm, because it was felt unethical. It's very easy to give in clinic, put a bit of Emla cream on the eardrum, light the patient down, 25 gauge needle, inject slowly. They swallow as you inject, and then you get them lying down, not swallowing, which is pretty difficult, 20 minutes. Then you repeat it two weeks later. So very, very simple treatment. And look at these results. I mean, just extraordinary. So the white line is gentamicin, and the black line is solumedrone. And this is the number of attacks beforehand in a six-month period, so 15 to 20 attacks before, two or three attacks in a six-month period up to two years. There's a 90% reduction in vertigo at two years following solumedrone. That's a huge number. And if we go through symptom scores, autonomic scores, vertigo scores, um, tinnitus, uh, fullness, everything comes down similarly in both groups. And functional scale improves as well. Hearing didn't change much, which did surprise me, but that's the outcome we found. Uh, speech discrimination was a bit better in the steroids. And as you might expect, um, the steroids 
produce much less damage to the vestibular apparatus on VEMS and chloride testing. So the steroids are more conservative and less destructive. So take-home message for intratympanic steroids. For many, particularly the steroids over gentamicin, often a first-line treatment for many as disease, average 90% reduction in attacks at two years. And actually, there's a further follow-up study at five years going to be published soon, which shows uh, continued benefit. And you can do top-up treatments in the interim. We've also done a study that some of you may be involved in with Autonomy, an American company, using a long-acting um, dexamethasone preparation, which stays around for weeks, stays in the ear for a very long period of time, and it has the advantage it's less painful and it just needs one injection. Several years ago, we started doing the studies, and there was a trend to reduction in vertigo. It all looked pretty promising. We carried on the studies, and then look at this. Is this the graph you dream of as a surgeon? So number of attacks... Before the injection, number of attacks after the injection. Intratympanic long-acting steroids. Wonderful. If only that were the case. That's the autonomy share price when the results of the study were published. $28 to $3. Pretty painful, I should think, for anyone who had them. It didn't reach statistical significance. But actually, from an exam point of view, this is also quite interesting. It was very close to statistical significance, whatever that means, but it didn't reach it. But probably some of it was over-enthusiasm from the treating physicians because the placebo response was very, very high. So we're now doing, I say we, I'm just one of the centres involved, a further study, which we're recruiting for. So any pure, many is very happy to see. Um, but we've had to go on placebo training courses. So we've got to be very flat and say we don't know what the result's going to be when we see the patients. And I don't know, I, you know, if it works, it will be wonderful for our patients. So watch this space. So we may have new developments in intratympanic steroids. Don't dismiss them, these long-acting ones. But the take-home message is solimedrone is, appears to be, I should say, appears to be, based upon our Lancet study, very effective indeed. Now, the gold standard treatment has always been gentamicin. Uh, it's riskier. There's a 5 or 6% risk of profound hearing loss. Uh, and it can also cause significant dizziness in patients. The, the methods are exactly the same as the steroids. In fact, you don't know which one you're giving if you're a patient. You can't tell the difference. And overall, we have, you just get the feeling that it produces a longer-term cure for the patients with many years disease. And about 80% have complete resolution of vertigo, and in the high 90% have effective vertigo control. So two wonderful treatments, intratympanic therapies, very cheap, very simple, have revolutionized management of this condition. So you've got to recognize it. And, of course, if you've got any doubt that it might be migraine, always err towards the steroids and don't use, don't use gentamicin. Don't use gentamicin in people with mild symptoms and rarely use it if the hearing is normal. So let's flip over. Now, I wanted to put these two talks together, or I've sort of tried to cross them over. I I'm interested in your feedback because I just think they're so similar, the conditions. I wanted you to have a chance to see them side by side. So let's think about migraine. Let's think about some numbers. So it's the second commonest cause of episodic dizziness after BPPV, and only just. In migraine clinics, a third of patients report episodic vert vertigo. In our balance clinics, about a third of patients, I often quote 40%, have migraine. It's massive, isn't it? Not necessarily vestibular migraine and spinning, but they have migraine associated with their imbalance or dizziness. And we need to be addressing that. You need to be addressing that when you see your patients, because it's all part of getting them better. And that number, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to withhold it from you. I'm going to say it again. Vestibular migraine is probably 10 to 20 times comma, commoner than many other disease. And the International Headache Society, and I have the whole book at home. It's pretty heavy reading, hundreds of pages, but there are lots of definitions of migraine. Before we get into vestibular migraine, I just want to look very quickly at a couple of other types of migraine. So you have migraine with aura, which is about 20% of migraine attacks, and patients often get stereotypic um, visual aura with zigzag lines, kaleidoscopes, black spots, hemiplegia. Now, there's an interesting one, hemiplegic migraine, like you're having a stroke. CACNA1A gene. Cacna 1A, does that ring any bells? Gold medal folk? No? Cacna 1A. Episodic ataxia type 2. Now that's on the differential diagnosis list of many ears disease. 
Huh. So there's lots of really interesting overlaps here. Now, usually migraine with aura, you get a headache afterwards. Um, and when you've got that, you know your patient's got migraine. But if it affects the posterior circulation, have a look at this. What happens if the posterior fossa is affected by the migraine? You might get dysarthria, dysplopia, hyperacusis, vertigo, tinnitus. Look at that. Reports of low-frequency hearing loss in up to 50% of patients with basal and migraine. Ah, uh, so now we've got a problem telling our patients they've got many of disease. So you've got to be alert. You've got to be thinking, what is going on here? What is this condition? Does it have a migraine flavor? And you'll learn the flavor of migraine as you go through. And always reflect back with the patient on what symptoms they had as a child. So migraine as a child might present as recurrent abdominal pain. You remember in A&E, all of those kids with recurrent mesenteric adenitis, yeah? It's migraine. Kid with torticollis, twisted neck. Migraine. Recurrent knee pain. Migraine. Kid who's travel sick. You must ask, were you travel sick as a child? That's migraine. So migraine presents in a lot of really strange ways. And if you can reflect back with the patient, they go, oh, yeah, I remember I had that. Then you've got a really strong guide to your patient being a migraineur. It doesn't say they're attacked to migraine, but migraineur. And you get these things, periodic syndromes, recurrent vomiting. There's lots of interesting things come through the, through the clinic. Now, in this really interesting bedtime read, published only last year, we now have a definition of vestibular migraine. It's pretty tight. I tell you, and it's going to evolve. It's quite, the definitions here are really difficult, and they're not, they're not good enough yet. But do you remember, you know, I remember when I started out training, BPPV was kind of, we didn't really have ECPI maneuvers, and it wasn't around. And then in the early, when I arrived in, in Leicester in 2004, everyone who came to me with episodic dizziness had, had many a disease. And then in the mid-2000, 2010, everyone had BPPV from the GP. Now... Everyone's got migraine, so everyone's cottoned on to it. So it was gone through phases. And it's not that long ago that people started thinking about this association. And I think this evolution of our understanding of diseases, particularly if you're just starting your career, is really interesting. So don't take things as if they're set in stone. <coughs> and I can absolutely guarantee the diagnoses of vestibular migraine, migraine-associated vertigo, migraine various balance disorder, whatever you want to call it, will change and evolve with time. But this is where we are at the moment. So it used to have a number of different terms. Try and use vestibular migraine as the term. And this is a bit of a heavy slide, so sorry. But you kind of have to know this one. Um, so what it's saying is to get a formal diagnosis of vestibular migraine, you have to have a history of migraine with or without aura in the past. Um, and you need to have had you know, a number of attacks, which are fairly severe. And you can, you can read yourself that for, for migraine, you've got a unilateral throbbing headache, and you get, or you get phonophobia, or you get visual aura. And any of those will allow you to get a diagnosis of migraine if nothing else fits. But the Barani Society, and again, if you're doing your exams, do, do look at this paper. The Barani Society put a footnote on it, which I think is really interesting. And that's that the spinning can be internal or external. It depends what part of the brain is affected by the migraine. Positional dizziness, you get visually induced dizziness, motion, in sense, uh, motion intolerance. But look at this. I think this is really interesting. That the migraine attacks can range from seconds, maybe a third minute, a third for hours, and a third for several days. So migraine attacks, vertigo, this is the vertigo of migraine, can last for very variable periods of time. And so we've run through this. There's a lot of questions to ask your patient to see if there's a clue that migraine might be causing it. And just to summarize, again, I've put another paper in here because I think it reinforces this. This is one of the earlier papers, uh, and this is a really classical paper. Um, it's a population study in, in Europe in 2004 showing that the vestibular symptoms can be rotational, illusion of movement, positional dizziness, huge range of time. And the other thing is, remember, about one in 10 migraine attacks do not have a headache. So you don't have to have a headache to have a migraine. But it helps. <laughs>
And just to make it more difficult again, we've already said that you can have a low-frequency hearing loss. Here's a migraineur with a low-frequency hearing loss. 20% of migraineurs have abnormal calorics, and when they're having a migraine, they can have ab abnormal BNG. So just stay alert. Again, there's loads of treatments, and for the last little bit of this talk, I'm going to whiz through the treatments, because you will make more patients happy than with any complex surgery you do in your life by telling them very, very simple things. And I'll just give you a few top tips here. Here are some of the triggers for migraine. If you're not sure, get them to keep a diary. It's quite useful. This is when I'm dizzy. This is what I ate. This is what I did. When, after a cycle ride, it was this, that, or the other. Talk about the six Cs. And I talk about this every single patient. This is the big one. When you're young and a medical student, you will be up at one in the morning with your cafetiere and black coffee, keeping you awake, studying. You get into your 40s and 50s as a migraineur, you have a small cup of coffee, you're going to get a migraine often. So cutting out caffeine <coughs> will cure more of your patients in your career than any or all of the operations you ever do. It, in the, it doesn't affect, affect everyone, but those it does, it makes a massive difference. And patients can't see it. So your role as a physician is to hold a mirror up to your patient and let them actually see their life. What are they actually... They kind of know deep down, but they can't accept it themselves. So go through these triggers. Think about hormones. We have a dizzy gynecologist in Leicester. And patients with menstrual migraine, I send over to him. Stress. Lots of different stresses. And, and you know, I have one lady who gets it, uh, gets migraine if she reaches five miles of cycling. Comes on, exercise induces. There's lots of different things. Poor sleep. Yeah, we're pretty good with that, aren't we? But migraineurs need a regular sleep hygiene. They need regular meals. They mustn't skip breakfast or lunch. There are drugs that can cause it, so have a look at what medication they're on. Exercise, we've said. And then for the acute attacks, well, you know, there is some evidence that triptans help. They may want to take normal non-steroidals. And then prophylaxis. So we start off with lifestyle and dietary prophylaxis. And if they're getting two or more attacks a month, then we discuss medication. And that would be my normal recommendation. And we would carry on the medicine for six to 12 months, usually, months. And there are four principal classes of treatment for vestibular migraine and, indeed, for, for migraine. And I'll run through these here very briefly. My preferred drug... The one I usually start with is a low dose of amitriptyline, 10 milligrams. Take it 12 hours before you get up, or the patient gets up. So if they get up at 7 in the morning, take it to 7 at night so they don't have a hangover effect. It can cause a bit of sedation. Don't give it in people with a cardiac history because it can promote dysrhythmia. And it can put weight on occasionally. And then you go up by 10 milligrams a month to a maximum of 60 milligrams at 6 months. And if they're too sedated, you can use nortriptyline. A lot of the neurologists and GPs will use beta blockers as an alternative. They're perfectly good. The problem with beta blockers, they just make you feel rubbish, our patients. They, people feel tired on beta blockers. So you've got to balance that up. Pisotifen, that's nice because it can be used in younger patients as well. Um, I don't use it so much because of weight gain. And then the one you'll have some very happy ladies with, so pyramate. Side effect is weight loss. Lots of people jump at that. It's misused sometimes. It's a pretty heavy-duty drug. They get paresthesia and lots of other <coughs> side effects, potentially, and they've got to work through that. Um, so just be a bit careful. And if you're not confident with it, maybe get your neurologist to prescribe topiramate. So there's a whole bunch of drugs you can use. Vestibular physiotherapy, if they've got a, an imbalance associated with their migraine, it, it's pretty difficult, but vestibular physiotherapy does seem to help. And I would add that in. Not for the acute attacks, of course, just for the disequilibrium. So there's a whole range of different treatments we can use for migraine. There is some overlap with what we do for Meniere's disease. There's massive overlap in the symptoms between Meniere's and migraine. And many patients have both conditions. But the key, as always, is spend a long time getting that history and being alert and cautious when you see test results, like hearing test results and calorics. Don't jump to conclusions. But it's actually it's an incredibly satisfying pair of conditions to treat that are very, very common in the balanced clinic. And you can make a huge difference to people's lives. 
There we are. Many as a migraine. Thank you.